Welcome to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. Coming up on today's show, we'll find out how big money, corporate interests have taken control over local courthouses. Your courthouse, your judge. We'll tell you how big box stores like Walmart are influencing federal laws. And we'll tell you the real reason why Republicans are so upset over Obama's executive order on immigration. We have all that and more coming up. And right now, just remember, you stepped into the ring of fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. That has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> Big box retail stores like Walmart and Home Depot have always been some of the most generous companies when it comes to giving money to corrupt politicians. They know how to do it. And that money's bought them a lot of political favors. Joining me now to talk about Big Box return on investment for political elections is Dave Tassell. David, who in the he- who would have thought that big box retail stores are setting the pace and setting the direction of our politics in this country? I mean, to think that Walmart or Home Depot, any of these people are setting our politics, that's what's happening, isn't it? Big box it, stores. It's amazing when you look at how the total spending has grown six times from 2000 to 2014, that we've reached almost $30 million in spending on federal elections alone by the big box retailers. We're talking about Walmart, Home Depot, Target. Uh, the, these, these big businesses have really jumped into the political fray and they've jumped in not just on, on small issues, but on all the big issues, on taxation, on health care, on the union labor divide. And, and they're really influencing and changing the way uh, the laws are being handled in this country. Well, okay, so how are they going? How does this work? I mean, how do you have a a big box store take money and, and, and change our politics by buying their politicians. How, do they do it directly? How does it all take place? Well, that, that's a great, let's, let's use Walmart as an example. And, and this, this, this past 2014, they've made $2.4 million in political donations. And they've spent an extra $12.5 million on lobbying the politicians. And what they do is they actually give money to the politicians so that they can run their campaigns and they can beat out their, their opponents. And then once they're in office, the big box retailers lobby them and go to them and ask for favors. And they want things such as, in Walmart's case, they, uh, the, the Walmart family wealth, uh, they go and, 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 and ask for the, uh, the estate tax uh, to, be, to be repealed so that the family can keep the money. And at the same time that their family has grown over 100% since 2007 in terms of their, their wealth, the typical household in this country, they've dropped 40%. It's that type of action. It's that type of, of big box companies coming in, going to the politicians, giving them money on the front end so that they can win election, elections, and then lobbying them and asking them for favors and for laws that are favorable to them once they're in office. Well, isn't part of it our fault because we actually give the big box stores so much money? I mean, we abandon mom and pop stores and we all want to shop at you know the big box stores. Isn't that part of the problem? I mean, th- this is amazing. I mean, you know, any city you go to in the country now, you seem to always see a Walmart and a Home Depot, and you don't see a diversity. You don't see the local local businesses surviving because the big companies come in, and when they when they when they get their politicians elected, they change the laws to protect them and protect their business model. They basically have uh, the taxation fall on the local communities, and they ask for the local communities to give breaks. And, uh, and, and things to the big box retailers to come in because they say that they're going to grow the labor force or help the economy. But the only people are actually helping are the big box retailers themselves. Well, David, if you look at the last cycle of elections where you actually had minimum wages that were increased in so many places by way of votes, if you take a look at who put the money into destroy and, and to try to fight back to where, no, we don't want minimum wages increased, it was the big box stores, right? It, it was. I mean, it really was. And w- it, what's really interesting, and I don't know that people understand this, is that this is really good for Republicans and really bad for Democrats. Because Walmart, for example, for every dollar that they spend 
on, on uh, a, a Democratic politician in terms of contributions. They spend $2, twice as much, on Republican uh, politicians and causes. And in fact, that goes up to three to one when you look at places like Lowe's and Target. And there, there's only one big box retailer that supports Democrats, it's Costco, and they've only spent $2 million over the past 15 years. Compare that to the $30 million being spent by the other big box retailers last year alone to influence these elections. Well, and, and one thing we've seen these big box stores do is go after any kind of labor rights. You, you handle the biggest labor cases there in, in Colorado and around the country. What kind of impact has the wall have the WalMarts and the Home Depots had on labor rights, uh, union rights, for example? They, they've had they've had a massive impact. I mean, there's been studies that have been done that have shown that since this influx, since this 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 big uh, additional push of money into politics, that whenever business has been up against labor on any of these issues, over 90 percent of the time, business is winning out. And laws that, that, such as the minimum wage law that you, talk, you, you talked about, that's very important, they're, they're, be, they're able to beat that back. Over 78 over percent of the people, recent poll, 78 percent of the people, that's a pretty, we can't, we can't agree on anything in this country, and almost 78 percent of the people agree that we should at least pay people poverty level minimum wage so that people can at least live just above the poverty line. But only 40 percent of wealthy Americans actually feel that same way. And what's really bad about this is that the, the huge amounts of money that are being put in by the Walton family and the big box retailers are drowning out the voices of the majority in this country. And that's what's really scary. Well, one thing we see happening that we know now after, after allowing Walmart and all these big box stores to go overseas to India and China and have all the manufacturing done over there, we've seen the impact of the United States. We've seen that we've lost we've lost industry. Now we've become a service we've become a service society. Uh, do how do politicians react to that? Are they doing anything to say, you know, if you go build uh, uh, plants over in India to pr to to produce widgets, then there's going to be there's there's going to be a price to pay. Are we doing anything as is is a government to try to to try to stop? these big box stores from shipping all of our jobs out of, out, we're, out of we're not we're no no we, we we spent how many times 50 times they voted to defund or, or voted to against obamacare our our government our our congress is not taking any action to protect the everyday worker and people in this country from the jobs going overseas and from all we are, as you said, we've become a service industry. We don't make anything anymore. And these big box retailers essentially come into the community. They put the mom and pop stores out of business, become a, become a monopoly. And then they don't, even, they don't even build or manufacture things here. They manufacture them overseas where they can do it cheaper and then sell it uh, to, the, to, to our communities at a higher price. You know, we went through this, we went through this uh, story uh, several years ago with Saipan, where the, basically what you had was, is sweatshop labor. And then you had ALEC and the United States Chamber, U.S. Chamber of Commerce saying, in, in effect, this is what they like to build here in the United States, is kind of sweatshop labor. Isn't that kind of what we're seeing in the in the big box setting already? Isn't this the first step towards that? I, I think it is. I mean, I think you, you, uh, talking about ALEC is important, too. I mean, we're talking about big box retailers and the Chamber of Commerce actually writing the laws to allow them to do things like this and then giving them to to the congressman or to who they, the, the officials that have been elected. And this is the first step toward, toward doing that. I mean, you look at one of the other big problems we have here, we have... We have Congress people, former com Congress people, who were given. Co there's a Walmart. There's an Arkansas Congresswoman, for example, who was paid eighty thousand dollars in in campaign contributions, got elected, uh, fought for for wa all of Walmart's big ideas, and and, and now that she's left. Uh, Congress is now an employee and a lobbyist <laughs> they, for they, Walmart. On the, now she's at least directly being paid, as, oppo as opposed to kind of the hidden it, way of it, being a it, paid for Congress, as opposed to being bought as a politician. Exactly, David Tissell, Thank you for uh, keeping us informed. Well, this is a story that gets bigger every day. People, it, it's almost like the, the the frog that's boiling in the big pot of water. They don't even know they're boiling. Most people watching this right now wouldn't believe that they are that frog in the water. But just Absolutely. watch another. Five Five years you'll see that you are boiling thank, thank you, you for joining me okay thank you 
President Obama has presented his nominee for Treasury Secretary, and as expected, we've been given another Wall Street shill. Not only is this one slap in the face to progressives, but they could have a huge impact on fiscal policy for all Americans. Join me now to talk about the president's nominee as Peter Mouget. Peter Antonio Weiss, just another one of the people you would expect Obama to pick. I mean, with Summers and uh, Geithner and, you know, the whole, the whole Robert Rubin crowd. Weiss is just an extension. What a terrible choice for this job. Talk about it. Lay, lay out the story for us. It's, it's, it's another it, it, ugly it, it, story. Here's the, it really is an ugly story. And you start to wonder, I mean, when is he ever going to figure this out? Wall Street on our top police force, whether it be the Treasury, the SEC, it doesn't matter. The regulators that are supposed to be there protecting Main Street, we're filling up those positions across the board with Wall Street bankers. It's called a revolving door, Pap. So essentially you're taking Wall Street, key Wall Street guys, putting them in regulatory police type positions that are supposed to create jobs, protect consumers. They work in the government for a few years and then they come back to the Wall Street jobs and that revolving door ends up protecting Wall Street because nobody's going to enforce the rules and regs against Wall Street against the place where they want to end up with the big payday. Okay, let, the, let me let me lay this out just a little bit as I see it. Now, here you have Antonio Wise that has been, he works for a company called Lazard, Lazard, L-A-Z-A-R-D. Yes, now, this is a company that came up with how companies such as Burger King could go out and, and basically declare that they're not an American corporation, that they're a foreign corporation, and not pay taxes. Now, what's important about that is Antonio Wise, the guy who Obama wants to, to, to run the Treasury, Antonio Wise is the guy they want to, uh, to make decisions about the, the, the direction of this country's money and economy. Now, now, did I get that right? Did Antonio Wise, is he the guy who came up with this, in, this inversion kind of idea? It's called, it's called the reversion concept where you take the headquarters, and you're exactly right. At Burger King, you take the, the nominal headquarters, meaning you get some office in a strip mall in a foreign company. You hardly staff it. That allows the company to avoid paying taxes because they're a foreign company with a foreign headquarters. Although the headquarters is just some nominal shell sitting in some strip mall somewhere that's not staffed. It's not really their headquarters, and it allows them to pay a lower tax rate. This is his brainchild. This is the guy we're putting in to help police and enforce Dodd-Frank and ensure that the Main Street consumers are being protected. The same guy that's pilfering money and diverting it um, out of our corporate tax coffers back into uh, and, and back this into is Wall the guy Street who Obama business. says, yeah, this is who I want running that. <clears throat> it gives you an idea of how ugly things have gotten. There, there's more. The, the other part of this story, I think, is is remarkable. Lazard is paying Antonio Wise twenty million dollars to leave the company. Now, why would they possibly pay Antonio Wise when he's leaving the company to take a government job? I mean, does I mean, that, do, do we really have to be rocket science to figure that out? out? The, as he's walking out the door, they're, they're, they're handing him a compensation package worth $21 million. It is a nothing more than a dressed up uh, payment to a government official saying, don't forget us when, when you're there. Don't forget us when you're enforcing the rules on Dodd-Frank at $21 million. We expect Weiss to objectively enforce the rules against people like his former employer when he took $21 million on the way out the door. How in the world, Pap, can that be uh, legal? How, I mean, it's, just, it's blatant, and it's right in your face, and it happens all the time. This isn't just some new concept that... Uh, that Weiss is getting paid. Bank of America did the same thing with a $9 million pop with one of its key officials that went to some nominal role in the regulatory agency. It's all about expecting favorable treatment when you get to the regulatory position and then they come back and make even more money. Peter, it's is Wall there Street any chills in, in police positions. That's all it is. Is it really even reasonable to believe that this president, Obama, who has done this time and time again with for Wall Street? Basically, he's working for Wall Street. Is it even believable to 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 even suggest 
that this president doesn't know exactly what he's doing when he allows this type of thing to go on. I mean, would he, would, you would have to be born under a damn mushroom not to understand the impact of this, wouldn't you? Uh, of course. I mean, keep in mind, wife is, Weiss is a, uh, was, it was a bundler for the Obama administration with key campaign contributions. So this is a guy, there you go again, campaign contributions, quid, quo, quid pro quo later for a, a good uh, a good regulatory job. But yeah, there's no way he doesn't know. Pap, I'm telling you, it's, it's fairly simple. Put a comp, a, a, a several well-financed uh, trial lawyers, former trial lawyers, securities lawyers in these positions and let them enforce the rules and you don't have these problems. Instead, we're taking Wall Street, Wall Street bankers and letting them enforce our country's securities rules well, and well, regulations. We used, it doesn't work. We used to say that there was something that was called, it was something that was called, uh, as you called, uh, uh, revolving doors or agency capture. <clears throat> this is actually agency purchase. Because as you talked about, like Bank America just there and, and Wise, what the corporations are doing, what Wall Street's doing, is they are buying the agency. And, of course, we've seen that. We, we saw it with Tom Wheeler with the FCC. Tom Wheeler, of course, comes from the FCC, and then he's put in the position of running the FCC and doing everything that industry wants. He was purchased the same way. We you're, see you're, it with the EPA purchase, isn't it? You're, you're exactly right. And it didn't used to be so in your face. It did, these payments weren't just so overt. They just, they just weren't so quite blatant. It, it's getting bigger and bigger and more of a problem. It used to be, well, we'll give you a job when you get back. These payments out the door, I mean, they're nothing. It's fraud. I mean, they're buying government officials on the way out the door. There's no other label you can put on it. Yeah, I mean, you give Wise $20 million, you know, when you, he's going to take your call, whereas you or I might call him and say, you know what, Mr. Wise, there is fraud and theft going on. Would you help us? That's different from you calling him or me calling him and the guy who handed him $20 million and, and calling him. You know him. and I know they're expecting one hell of a lot more than picking up the phone or when, when you call. They're expecting favorable treatment, not, 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 not if they get into trouble, but when they get into trouble – they're expecting Wall Street get favorable treatment at the expense of consumers. Peter, in about no thirty seconds, about in about thirty seconds, uh, the Democrats are, are this. This is their thing, just like it is the Republicans. Now we got Hillary Clinton running. Hillary is very much a part of that same established Wall Street establishment, isn't she? Oh, Bill Clinton. Uh, the, the, he um, brought in uh, one of the gold, one of the Goldman Sachs, the, the big wigs from Goldman Sachs during his era. This is the same establishment. It's all about dollars. It's all about funding for campaigns. All they're all intertwined between the co campaign financing, the revolving doors. This is an I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine later on. Pat, this this has got to be broken. We already had one major disruption, almost melted down the entire economy. It's not a it's matter gonna of, of when it's gonna, it, it's going to happen again. It's going to happen. Ma Peter Maget, thank you for joining me, okay? Thank you. The right wing talking heads love to tell us that a good guy with a gun can help prevent tragedies like we've seen in the last few years. But as it turns out, open carry laws and rising gun ownership have actually caused even more unnecessary deaths. Joining me now to talk about that is progressive host David Pakman. You know, the big sale, uh, David, is you carry a gun, you're going to be safer. More people with guns are going to make us uh, safer. Uh, the, well, the votes are in. The numbers are in. The statistics are in. What a lie. Yeah, absolutely. And for a long time, the NRA and similar groups have been pointing to this 1997 study by Lott and Mustard called More Guns, Less Crime as a kind of indicator that actually the more guns you have, the fewer crimes you have. And that study just completely misses the boat. It was pre the significant change in the crime rate in this country after the crack epidemic started being dealt with. And we actually now have newer data from 1999 to 2010. And it shows that actually the states that have enacted these right to carry laws that have seen huge rises, a huge increase in the number of guns that people are carrying actually have more aggravated assault and more homicide. You know, there's a backstory to this. I know you know it. Uh, the 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 um, what you'll see industry do sometimes is create just false literature. I mean, they'll just come up with they'll hire some cat in you know California or from Harvard or Yale, someplace like that. They'll try to give they'll try to give credibility to the study, and then you find out that the study really was all about 
selling more of their product. And that's the situation here with guns. We, we know now, we, we took a look at some of the early documents, we know now that part of, the, part of the scheme here was to create literature that led us to believe that we're all going to be safer if we carry guns. And we find out now it was really, it was really just to sell guns. We see them do that type of thing with uh, other aspects of, of, of trying to sell guns. What, what do we see the gun industry do every time they want to see gun, gun sales increase? What are the types of things you, you've seen them do? Oh, I mean, there's a, there's a huge laundry list. Of course, any time that there is an attack, any kind of violent incident, the NRA and similar groups show up. They send their teams out in force to corporate media to talk about how dangerous the world is and how, as a result, people need to have more guns. Of course, when we have a period of, of, a, of a lull in crime or where there's no big crime story, then the reason people should have more guns is because the guns themselves are responsible for this decrease in crime. And it's for, from their point of view, any circumstances, any situation that we have in this country is a justification for increasing the number of guns that people have. And they're a paid gun lobby group. Their business is increasing the number of guns that are sold. When we take a look at the corrected data that, you know, uh, where we actually go back and we look at the data that was sold to us or sold to Congress or sold to state legislators about the need for more guns, and it's corrected, it, it really shows it, it's fairly disastrous, isn't it? There's no question about it. If you actually look, you know, aggravated assault is a really good example because it's this kind of in between. It's not a full out murder homicide situation but it's the type of situation that the gun activists will tell you if there's this broader understanding that more people have guns you should see fewer aggravated assaults because why would criminals knowing that so many people have guns try to try to uh, 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 do that type of crime and what you actually see is that aggra aggravated assault increased by almost eight percent in the states that adopted these right to carry laws relative to states that didn't. And as I mentioned at the beginning, you also saw as an aside, the rate of homicide go up in those states too. Is there some issue, the, the issue I see developing right now, and the NRA got ahead of this, and it was probably smart that they did, is they saw the, the real moon bats, I mean the real lunatics were showing up at schools with you know, the right to carry, they'd have, they'd be, have, have their guns strapped on the side or they would show up at a church or, you know, some, some meeting where they were simply trying to make a point, some ridiculous point about the right to carry. What kind of impact was that having on, on the, the politics of gun sales? That was having a huge impact because you had these programs. The NRA has a specific program meant to start getting children into the gun culture earlier than ever. I mean, the NRA has a program for kids that are five to seven years old to start teaching them what they characterize as gun safety. And then the existence of those programs was then used by legislators who wanted to keep gun laws relaxed and said, listen, we have a better way of dealing with this than than legislation. We have a program like the NRA program to start teaching kids about gun safety. And it's the system of piggybacking the NRA would create this program, legislators would piggyback on it, and then the gun rights groups would go back and say, hey, look, even the legislators think that these classes are a better idea than actual gun safety laws. I, I think any movement has what, what I call the moon bat factor. The moon bat factor always detracts from, uh, from what an organization wants to do. I, I think that it, it appeared to me that the moon bat factor was so crazy uh, over the last uh, year, a year and a half with the real, the real, the people who were so disconnected from reality trying to make a point about their right to carry guns. Did the NRA get that under control from a PR standpoint at this point, do you think, or, or, or is it still going on? I mean, do you still get these moon bat stories on a regular basis where, you know, Johnny Doomkoff shows up at, uh, at, at a school or at some public gathering with a with an AK-47 or a, a 357 strapped on his leg to make a statement. Are you seeing that as much as we used to see that? Yeah, there, there are certainly uh, any number of those stories. And the NRA is only interested in getting that element under control to the extent that not having it under control would, would hurt gun sales. So if having that element be present in, in corporate media helps gun sales, the NRA, quite frankly, wouldn't really care about getting the moon bat narratives out of the discussion to the extent that it kind of hurts the PR perspective of the gun activist groups, 
That's the extent to which the NRA wants to limit those individuals and those voices. The more guns in more places all of the time, guns in bars, guns in schools, etc. The NRA only cares about limiting that to the extent that it'll hurt their gun sales. Do you see any, any, any do you see any trend at all that seems to have any kind of adverse effect on the NRA at this point, or is it just business as usual? Well, the the best trend is that when you fairly pull Americans and say, without attaching all sorts of coming to take your guns uh, 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 ad hominems to it, and just say, do you think we should have the following provisions as far as background checks when it comes to getting a firearm? Overwhelmingly, Americans say yes, 80, 85, 88 percent. So that's a good start. The only problem is we have elected officials that are not representing the will of their constituents. In spite of the fact that almost nine out of 10 Americans wanted stricter background checks, we couldn't get it through Congress. About 30 seconds. What the, it's been kicked around in some places that maybe we ought to have, you know, you talk about drug testing for people who want to, to receive a welfare check. Uh, what about the movement that says we ought to have drug testing for people who want to purchase firearms? I think that you could draw a much more direct line between firearms and drug usage leading to crime than you could to any negative adverse effects from welfare recipients on drugs, which, by the way, in Utah and Florida, they tried that. It was expensive. It didn't make any sense. Well, here we might make sense. Actually, it might save a life or two if we do a little bit tougher screening. David Pakman, thank you for joining me. This is a story that uh, it, it, it's been out there for 10 years. I think it'll be out here another 10 years till we figure out how to stop killing each other and own guns at the same time. I think both things are possible. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. The midterm elections didn't just hand Congress over to the Republicans. They also gave a host of courthouses all over the country to big businesses. Judges were purchased in that process. Corporate money was the big winner in the judicial elections. I have David Haynes here to tell you what that means to our civil justice process. David, judges for sale. Man, who would have ever thought that we would be here now? Citizens United has opened up a whole new area where we sell <laughs> Well, where we sell influence, and we have judges for sale right now, don't we? Well, we certainly do, and, and you know the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Fortune 100, the Fortune 500 companies are realizing it's a lot cheaper to have incredible influence over one of these judicial elections than it is over one of the uh, political elections, and, and they're pouring money into states like North Carolina, uh, West Virginia, and other states, and uh, when they have cases, of course, in front of the court, and so it, it's, a, it's an incredible conflict. Well, how do they go about doing it? I mean, they just, uh, how, how does the money change hands? Well, we have these outside groups that are, have been established. Primarily, one of the main uh, groups is the Republican State uh, Leadership Committee, which is spending millions of dollars, and, and it's various front groups. And as you said, after Citizens United, we have unlimited spending that can uh, basically come in. You have the tobacco companies, for example, particularly in the state of North Carolina that have a lot of litigation in the state courts are the primary funders of many of these candidates. And uh, you have all around the country millions of dollars is now being spent. You had in the, in the state of North Carolina, for example, where there used to be public uh, campaign funding of these candidates, $250,000 per candidate. All of that has been scrapped a couple of years ago, and now we're seeing that the spending has basically uh, five to tenfold what it used to be. And uh, it's, it's an air war, you know, political ads being purchased, and uh, the corporate uh, interests are uh, basically able to buy these seats if they can. What areas are they focusing on as far as the kind of litigation? In other words, you have corporations coming in and simply buying the judge because they want to change particular kinds of, uh, of laws or litigation. What are the, what are the areas that you're seeing them, their bought judges um, uh, have emphasis in? Well, 90% uh, of the business litigation in our country is handled in the state courts. And of course, as your viewers know, federal judges in the U.S. Supreme Court are not, are not elected, they're appointed, which is what the policy that should be. So the Republicans, the chamber, and, and uh, uh, big corporations in America are fo focusing on these states which have elected judges where they have business interests, particularly uh, mergers such as the Reynolds uh, Lorillard uh, merger, which is a $27 billion proposed mer merger coming out of the state of North Carolina. They're very concerned that 
that might not be approved. We have tort litigation, of course, uh, for uh, smokers uh, due to the defective uh, product and, and cigarettes and the lies that the tobacco industry has propagated. And so they're going into the states where they know they're subject to litigation and trying to uh, in, in, in influence these judges and get their candidates on the bench. And then when their cases are being heard, lo and behold, these judges are not recusing themselves but are deciding the cases of the actual litigants who are the parties that funded all of these campaign ads, albeit through an independent organization like North Carolina Justice for All. Well, we're seeing it at all levels. Is that right? I mean, explain the different levels. How, 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 does that, how do they spread the money out? Well, it's, it's being spread out. There are uh, a, a little over 20 states in, in America that have uh, elected uh, judges. And then we have about another 16 uh, states which actually have retention elections where the, initially there's an appointment and then the, then the voters will decide if the judge should be retained. And so these are the states, of course, that they are, are targeting and they're spreading it out through these uh, independent companies. And often you don't know who is funding uh, these judges. And in North Carolina, for example, the, uh, the, the average voter does not even know what party the candidate is affiliated with. Uh, of course, those who are closely observing the elections do, and those corporate entities who are funding them do, but otherwise it really comes down to a name recognition issue, and that's why this spending is so important. If one candidate is, is getting 10 times the funding of the other candidate, usually the, the Democratic candidate is, is insufficiently funded, it's a name recognition game. These judges are not that well known, but because voters see their ads again and again, they're most likely the ones that are going to win, win the election. So it's being spread out all across the states, and, and it's a real focus now of these corporate interests. So it begins, uh, I guess, if, you, if we take a look at the, the issues, such as you talked about tobacco, or maybe it's fracking, maybe it's offshore drilling, maybe it's the coal mine industry, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, Wall Street issues. Do they begin spreading the money all the way out to the, to the local trial judges, and then does it move up to the appellate system? Uh, it does, yeah. Any, anyway, there's certainly trial, uh, the trial court decisions, uh, they're very important because uh, if they can win at the trial court level, then they have an advantage, obviously, on the appellate level. A lot of the money is being uh, poured into the Supreme Court uh, levels because those are the most high-profile uh, uh, seats, of course, and they know that the big disputes uh, are likely going to reach the Supreme Court, and so then they can try to guarantee a reversal. But as you said, if you look in, in the states where we have elections and where we have uh, corporate pollution, uh, you, you know, other product liability uh, problems. You mentioned the state of, of West Virginia has a terrible history. That, that's another uh, state where we have elected officials and we've had reports of uh, members of the Supreme Court being wined and dined in the Mediterranean by uh, uh, corporate litigants who have business before the court. And, you know, the judicial branch should be separate. It should be a place where citizens, uh, everyday people can go and be sure that their case is heard fairly. The U.S. Supreme Court is not elected, of course. Federal judges are not elected. But in these certain states, we have a situation where individuals are not able to fairly have their case heard because the corporation has already had tremendous influence on the court before they even got there. They bought the judge. Now, for example, yes. we, we see this case, the developed U.S. Supreme Court now is deciding whether they should take and review the case in BP. And now we find out that, there, that Judge Alito's son actually works for the law firm that's handling the BP case, and Judge Scalia's son actually works for the law firm that is representing BP. But nevertheless, these two judges won't remove themselves from the case. And so thousands of lives are affected by that. What, on, on, on a bigger scale, are we seeing the same thing with these what I call bought judges in the states where they're saying, no, we're, we're going to continue hearing the case, even though we know we're bought and paid for. You're, you're absolutely right. If they, if they refuse to recuse themselves or remove themselves uh, from the case, there really is no check on that at all. There's no other uh, remedy that the uh, uh, plaintiff or, or the individual litigant has in, in those cases. And so it's just, no, I don't see a conflict, even though my son is, is working for the firm, uh, which is representing uh, this litigant, or even though I received a, a million dollars from uh, R.J. Reynolds, and now I, I'm going to hear the case. I don't believe I'm, I'm biased. So this is an incredibly dangerous uh, situation. It certainly seems as if appointed judges uh, is, is certainly the way to go. We need to have uh, you know, the judicial branch continuing to be non-politicized, non-influenced by outside corporate money, and that clearly is the uh, better and more sound policy. But, but right now, that, not, that is not the case. And right now, not I think all. if I listen to you <laughs> accurately, 
these judges are simply being purchased by the highest bidder who can come in and say, judge, here's money for name recognition. And then after they're elected, I guess they worry about the fact, will they be there for me the next time? Will that corporation be there for the next time? And I guess it just gets worse and worse. David, thank you for joining me. This is a horrendous story because it affects everybody. Every, every, everybody listening to this broadcast, this is happening in their backyard, and, and that's a real tragedy. David Absolutely. Haynes, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, very you. informative as usual. Thank you, Pat. President Obama's recent executive order on immigration has been one of the few times that he's been willing to stand up to the Republican Party, and they're pretty livid about that whole decision. He's made the entire GOP feel impotent, and I have author Paul Waldman here to tell us about the details. Rabble rousers in the street in the D.C. Beltway, uh, you know, they brought the pitchforks out. How dare Obama actually do something about immigration? Uh, get, where's this story? Where's this story going, Paul? I, this is every day. It's some new, re, it, it, some iteration of how how bad it is that Obama actually took some 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 action here. Yeah, I think a lot of it is really play acting to a great extent. You know, the the Republicans are in this terrible quandary. Uh, it's one of a number of quandaries they have. You know, on the one hand, they know that if they're going to win the White House in 2016, they can't alienate. Hispanic voters. Uh, on the other hand, they have a bunch of people in Congress who were uh, basically elected from conservative states and very conservative districts who really dislike this president, don't like when he takes executive actions that make them feel powerless, uh, and don't want to see any kind of comprehensive immigration reform. And so you have this constant tension within the party between uh, not wanting to do things that are going to kind of bring out their own worst instincts and they, you know, put people like Steve King uh, into the headlines and on TV. Um, and on the other hand, they have to be able to make some kind of a, a powerful statement uh, to satisfy those within the party who, who want to kind of strike back at Obama. So the question is, how it, can they it, do the, that? the irony is, this is kind of this is kind of a result of what they have to live with because of gerrymandering. If you think about it, I mean, the, the gerrymandering uh, uh, maps look like let's try to let, let's try to take the, the the folks who might be candidates for one flew over the cuckoo's nest and put them within our little district, and that's what the Republicans are having to live with. So now I, this is this is interesting. I'm, I'm hearing this concept coming from the Republicans that there ought to be something called self-deportation. Talk to me about that a little bit. What is self-deportation, and and what's the, how does that tie up to what uh, what's happening in this immigration fight? Well, it's something that Mitt Romney said back in 2012, and that didn't go over too well with Hispanic voters. What it essentially means is that you make life miserable enough for undocumented immigrants that they decide to go back to the countries that they fled from instead of staying here. Um, but the question is, how are you going to do that? You know, we're talking about millions of people. Uh, and so uh, the pro you know, that, that, that's a practical problem. But, you know, to be honest, the kinds of folks who advocate that generally aren't thinking too practically in, in general. They want to be able to, to make statements. You know, they want to be able to, to express their displeasure and the displeasure of their constituents. As you, you say, a lot because of gerrymandering, a lot of them come from districts where you know, it's impossible to find a Democrat. And so the thing that they need to do to keep getting reelected is to keep channeling that displeasure that, they're, that their own constituents have, but that hurts the party in, uh, on the national level. And so, so you know, the idea that they're going to eventually come up with some kind of a solution is just a fantasy. And that's one of the things, you know, you heard them, so many of them say, oh, you know, this is going to poison the well if Obama does this. Uh, and the, the presumption of that, of course, is that had he not done it, then they they might have come up with some kind of a an immigration bill on their own, but but nobody <laughs> Not really thinks that's going to happen because they're just their constituents don't want a comprehensive reform and they personally don't want comprehensive. Reform. Well, Paul, don't you think that the the average Republican knows that they've lost this fight? I mean, I, I all the numbers I look at, it's almost overwhelming. Uh, the Latino vote. Uh, sees them not just on the immigration issue, but they, they see them on law and order as being horrible. They see them on safety net as being horrible, education. Be, so l l the Latino com co community is not just buying in to the fact that the Republicans have become dysfunctional only because of immigration. 
And I'm wondering, what is your observation about whether the Republicans can ever walk themselves back by maybe throwing up a candidate like, uh, uh, you know, that, that can that can sp that has the ability to to connect with them? And, you know, Ronald, Ronald Reagan used to say that that Latinos are Republicans. They just don't know it yet. Uh, and there's some degree on some issues where that might be true, that there might be some more social conservatism there. But the problem is you can never win over a group of voters if, you're, if your party is constantly expressing a kind of fundamental hostility toward them and people like them. And, you know, for the average, for the average Latino person, an undocumented uh, worker who's in the country, that's not an abstraction. That's not, you know, the spear point of some invading horde. Those are people. They know those people. You know, they might even be related to those people. And so when when the Republican Party is constantly expressing that kind of hostility and it brings out so much ugliness, inevitably, when we have these kind of debates, um, you're just never going to get past that as a party if, uh, with that group of voters if that's what you're doing. And so, uh, Paul, you know, let me ask you something. I think the corporate media has done an awful job trying to 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 try to round out what what is the what is the Latino that's been put into this this mess? of do they go, do they stay, what's the future like? It, describe what a typical situation is out there. Well, what uh, the people who are going to be covered by Obama's executive order are have to be have to have been in the country for five years or more. They have to be parents of uh, someone who is themselves a, a child who is a, a legal U.S. resident or a United States citizen. Um, uh, and so uh, and they also expanded the group of the quote unquote dreamers, people who came here as children. Um, more of them are going to be able to stay, too. Um, but that leaves a lot of people out, too. You know, the parents of those dreamers, for instance, are not going to be able to stay. So if you are an undocumented immigrant, you brought uh, in a child who, who is still undocumented themselves, they'll be able to stay, but you won't. And and that, you know, could result in the breakup of families. So there's there's potentially a few million people who could be covered by this, but there's still going to be a lot of people left out. And that's uh, leaving some uncertainty there. So, but we're still talking mostly the people who are going to be covered. It's mostly about keeping families together. You know, it's the parents of kids who can stay. You know, what what the Obama administration is saying: we don't want to break up these families and you know tear these parents away from their children. Um, and so, what you have then is is a very sympathetic group of uh, of of people who are who are receiving this this new. Well, that, that's pretty staff. ugly. That's pretty ugly film footage that I could visualize here where uh, you know, the parents are being carted off. The children are here or vice versa, whatever the situation may be. That That's pretty tough for the Republicans to overcome here. And so what I'm wondering is what are the candidates going to do in this next election? What are they going to say? We're for it. We're against it. I don't know. I'm going to go talk about it. I, it, it's it's almost it's almost checkmate if the if the Democrats have enough sense to use it, which they generally don't. Well, the, the Republican cancer candidates are going to have a real problem because on the one hand, this is obviously very unpopular with the with the Republican base and not not even so much because of the substance of it, uh, but because of the fact that it's, it's Barack Obama doing it and doing it without the Republican Congress's permission. And so imagine now it's two years from now or, or a little bit before two years from now. It's the uh, it's it's the heart of the uh, the election. And by now, you've got this group of people who have had this temporary status for two years. So Republican, a Republican candidate, on the one hand, is going to have to say to his base, oh, I'm, I'm terribly opposed to this. I want to undo whatever Barack Obama does. But if you think about it, what would that mean? That would mean that, that after having this legal status for two years, you're now going to rip these people away from their children. That's going to be extraordinarily unpopular, especially in a general election when you are going to be facing so many Latino voters. So I don't know what a Republican candidate would say to try to satisfy those two demands. Well, the only person I can see uh, going forward and saying that would be people like Peter King or maybe uh, Ted Cruz and saying, yeah, that's that's fine. Let's just let, let's just rip them away from their families. But truthfully, most of these candidates would be willing to do that if they thought that the optics wouldn't be so ugly. Paul Waldman, thank you for joining me. As usual, the material is very informative. It's the backstory to what's happening out there. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Paul Waldman is the author of the book, Being Right is Not Enough. So, Pap, we have another case of another grand jury failing to indict a police officer in the killing of another unarmed uh, black man. This one, of course, is out of Staten Island, New York, where uh, Eric Garner 
was killed by a police officer who put him in a chokehold, ostensibly because uh, Garner was selling Lucy cigarettes, single cigarettes. And um, it's shocking. It, it, it's perhaps even more shocking than the Ferguson case because, of course, we have video. Yeah, and, and, and that, makes it, that makes this analysis really important. I, to me, Sam, it's impossible to analyze the facts of this case without understanding why the chokehold w- that we saw in the video, <laughs> why the chokehold was banned as being off limits, not only by New York police, but uh, in law enforcement organizations all over the country. Uh, I mean, in fact, the only time an officer is permitted to use a chokehold is when his life is threatened, is in danger, or the life of another officer is. And there are about a half a dozen other types of body-to-body restraints that are more effective, and they work, you know, work just as well. Uh, in New York, even after the banned use of the civil, uh, after they said you can't use this anymore, the Civil Complaint Board uh, was receiving about 200 reports of chokehold every year, which means there are probably triple that actually going on. They only got 200 reports. But it's important to understand how violently dangerous the chokehold is. Uh, usually if it's, done, uh, if, it, if, if it's done like most people do it, which is not properly, it crushes inches of the windpipe. It obviously cuts off the steady flow of oxygen to the brain. In addition to that, it often closes off the carotid artery, which uh, supplies blood to the brain. In fact, if the hold isn't done properly, it has the potential to tear the the carotid artery. Then add to that all the continuing complicating factors such as respiratory impairment, such things as COPD or asthma or blood flow restriction problems, and predictably, people die needlessly. Uh, And and so you you have to, and, and when the coroner, Sam, I think this is really important, when the coroner first determined to classify Gardner's death as a homicide, <clears throat> those are the types of physical evidence that he would be looking at. It would be the whole constellation of those things. Right. And I wonder, you know, uh, Pap, one of, this is a question that I had um, uh, for you, among others, is when the, the – I mean – when the medical examiner uses that term homicide, which the medical examiner's office did, and said that the primary cause was, in fact, uh, the police officers uh, imposing the chokehold and putting pressure on his chest uh, and his face, um, how is it that there's no indictment here? How is it even that we don't see a manslaughter or something, particularly when the policeman is using a technique that has been specifically banned by the police department. Well, okay, truthfully, it, the, the reality of, of these types of cases is that it makes no difference what the coroner found. Uh, when this prosecutor wanted to go to the grand jury, he knew exactly what he wanted to accomplish, and that is to come back with no bill. Uh, there's very little question uh, that the forensic experts, that the DA, the, the prosecutor, paraded through the hearing were police-friendly pathologists. They routinely are called to help police officers make their cases in court. Uh, If they don't produce for police officers in situations like this, then their testimony career is over. I mean, they they go without food. Uh, So the same same way that the DA has uh, has this relationship with the grand jury and the police officers, so does, so do most of the experts that come in and testify on behalf of police officers. You know, this is a DA, for example, uh, that we're going to see. He, you know, he's already, he at one point wanted to run for a Republican gr- congressional right. representative seat there in the Staten Island I- area. He needs the policemen's unions. He needs the police department to support to, to support him every day to make his cases in court. And these forensic, the, these forensic biostitutes is what I call them. They come through and they say whatever has to be said. Well, the average, the average layman juror out there, they, they don't have any idea they're being hustled. Hell, nobody's even asking them questions. So, so the grand jury system, because of that, Sam, has only become it's 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 become useless. It's become this gamed hustle that's rigged according to the political wishes of very ambitious uh, DAs. Which, uh, truthfully, if you follow the, most of these DAs that do at, at this level, they're just looking for the next political office. Well, I mean, so, so isn't this a very strong argument for a sort of an institutionalized special prosecutor, particularly when it comes? to questions of police officers, right? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. they it's the DA wants to maintain this relationship with 
uh, police officers. And so they used this, the grand jury as some type of basically fig leaf to let these officers off. Uh, right. what, what's your sense about a special well, prosecutor? Yeah. Hey, and also tie in, because I imagine in this Eric Garner case, there's going to be a pretty big lawsuit against the city for a wrongful death, I would oh, imagine. Sure. And I would imagine part of that argument is somehow this may implicate the idea of no special prosecutor. Well, OK, first part of the question, the, the inherent conflict of interest issues in uh, with the, rep, uh, the relationship between the D.A. and the grand jury is overwhelming. The legal the legal infrastructure that's put in place everywhere uh, from the very beginning is there to protect the cops. I mean, that's simply put from whether it's the grand jury to protect them, whether DA's to protect them, whether the judge is going to protect them. The, su- the Supreme Court in a series of rulings as far back as the 80s gave police this green light by telling them that the total decision making about using deadly force came down to whether what was the officer's subjective belief was it that another officer life uh, that another officer's life was threatened was it that he was threatened with serious bodily injury and then there's nobody there's no way to get behind that you see it's called objective reasonableness is the term the police officer always wins and he simply wins by using this fear card testimony. It works all the time. Also, we've created this myth that there are only a, a few bad apples, Sam, that there are only a few rogue cops out there that are doing this. If you take a look at the uh, at a few of the Internet websites that catalog this endless list of brutality and savagery that plays itself out by law enforcement from California to New York in all points in between. It's overwhelming when you look at it. Look, look at a site called the National Police Misconduct Reporting Project. That is a phenomenal site that gives you an idea of how bad this problem is. Add to that, Sam, the thing you and I have t- talked about in the past, I think, this concept of the thin blue line. The, the thin blue line is, is a term that, that, that comes into where police and judges and prosecutors uh, are almost in this blood-type commitment of protecting right. police and judges and prosecutors. If you go back and take a look at the Frank Serpico story, it, was, it tells the story of the thin blood, uh, blue line in a real, in a real way. Uh, you, you can better understand the result of all of that is that police indictments are as rare as Haley's Comet. And it's never going to change unless they move to something like you're saying, which is a national standard that's a little bit better than this. And to answer the second part of your question, the, the case that you're talking about will be called, it'll be a 1983 civil rights case. And the standard in there is much different from a criminal standard. You simply have to show in this particular case that there was a police standard protocol of how to handle a situation like this, and the officers violated that protocol. That's really all you have to show in this case, and I think it's going to be a home run. Whoever handles it, it's just a matter of, of how much. You know, It's not a matter of and it, are they going to prevail. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com or on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio and on Facebook. I'm Mike Papantonio. We'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.